this is joint work with my co-authors, Kaveh and De Pavle. So first, what's the problem I'm talking to you about today? So if you used one of these backup systems without using any of our approaches, what you'll discover is that over time, chunk fragmentation builds up, which causes restore speed to become slower. So let me give you some intuition on where this chunk fragmentation comes from. So these are backup systems, and basically each day we receive, for this example, we're just going to deal with one system, a backup of that system that we're supposed to store. Now in these and all the other pictures in the talk, these of course are not to scale. So for here I'm showing you eight chunks, for example. Obviously a real backup has millions or billions of chunks, but I can only show you so many chunks. So this data basically streams in and we need to deduplicate it. Deduplication, as you would imagine, is pretty simple. The data that's not in the store, we basically copy into the store and we point to it. Eventually we may come to some data that's already in the store, and so instead of copying that data again, we just point back to the existing copy. And this way we can proceed and deduplicate the entire backup. Now these arrows I'm showing here are what amounts to the file recipe of the previous speaker, which is to say it's a, a representation that tells you in order for your backup, the first chunk goes over, lives over here, the second chunk lives over here, the third chunk lives over there, and how big the chunks are, and so on. Now of course backup is one of these things that's an ongoing process. So the next day we get a new version of the backup. And usually data doesn't vary too much from day to day. So in this case I'm showing you chunk B has been deleted and chunks H and I have been added. We proceed as usual to deduplicate, adding the new chunks to the end and pointing to the existing data as a possible. Now you may notice that the recipe is becoming a little more tangled here than it was last time. And this in fact is the general trend. So if we go on to the third day, once again I delete a chunk, add a couple chunks, and then we deduplicate it, now we're getting really tangled. What's really going on here is that the new chunks are getting added to the end of the, of the store, and the old chunks are basically left where they are. And this means because backups mix data of different ages, we get fragmentation on the store and a tangled recipe. And you may say, so what? Well, the problem is this makes restore speed very problematic. So we want to restore our backup. So we want to basically logically start on the left and go across and get our, all our data back and send it to the client. Straightforward in the logical space. But when we look at what we actually have to do on the store, it looks like this. Every one of these red lines is a random seek. This is bad news. So to restate basically, chunk fragmentation builds up over time, causing excessive seeks per megabyte restored, leading to slow restore speed. Now before I tell you about our approaches to helping with this problem, you may be thinking to yourself, why don't we just defragment data periodically like the file system people do? There are a couple problems with this. First is that no layout of chunks makes most backups restore fast. This is because backups disagree about the optimal order of chunks. Maybe the recent backup thinks that this data should be next to this data, and another thing thinks it should be next to that data, and another one thinks it should be next to that data. They just don't agree. Now to some extent you can get around this by just saying let's focus on the last week's backups. But that's actually in many cases a large percentage of the backups that you might be saving. But more problematically, rearranging chunks can be expensive. So for example, suppose we wanted to keep the chunks of the last backup in order. It turns out this means we have to move two orders of magnitude more data. So for example, if we had a 30x dedupe factor, there's 29 old chunks on average for every one new chunk. So to just instead of writing a couple new chunks, we have to write the new chunks and the 29 times more old chunks. And that's a lot more data to move. So for this work, we concentrated on improving the restore speed without rearranging data. So before I tell you about our approaches to improving restore speed, I need to tell you how we measure fragmentation and restore speed. So before that, um, so I showed you in my original picture this nice sort of single linear piece of storage as if we stored our ch all the chunks in a single giant file. For various reasons, people don't actually do this. What they actually do is divide it up into small discrete files. Per the literature, these are about four, um, sorry, four megabytes long. So it's not so much that we're doing random seeks in a giant large file, it's that we're doing lots of different container accesses. So how should we go about measuring the fragmentation of a backup? There are of course many ways to, vary fra to, yeah, to measure fragmentation depending on what you want to do with your measure. In our case, we want to a restore speed relevant measure. We observe that reading containers is the dominant restore cost, so we suggest the following fragmentation metric. Containers read per megabyte restored during a simulated restore of the backup. Or in plainer words, we're going to simulate restoring the backup and count every time we do an access to a disk to read in a container in the simulation. And then we're going to divide by the size of the backup we just restored. Now, I'll tell you in a minute about how we do restoration in terms of the simulated algorithm, but this is going to depend on the caching being used. Now, this is a fragmentation metric that has a nice property. 
that it depends only on the recipe and the cache size. In particular, it does not depend on the I.O. characteristics. And in spite of the fact that it doesn't depend on the system I.O. characteristics, it will still be the case that the restore speed is proportional to one over the container read, sorry, containers read per megabyte restore. It's quite a mouthful, so we just call it the speed factor. But basically, the reciprocal of our fragmentation measure is linearly proportional to the restore speed. Now, of course, we're not capturing every part of restore time variance in this metric. In particular, we're not capturing differences due to chunk container size, file system physical fragmentation, things like variances in seek time, because some containers are close together and some are far apart. But the majority of the variance is, in fact, captured. So this is going to let us, by comparing speed factor, tell if two approaches are, which of two approaches is better without worrying about the exact details of the system we're thinking about. So how do we simulate restoring a backup? The baseline algorithm is fairly simple. We iterate through all the chunks in, a, in the backup we want to restore in order. For each chunk, we read in its chunk container. We extract the chunk's data out from the chunk container, and then we send it out to the client. There are a few subtleties with this. One, of course, is that in practice, for this thing to run fast enough, you need some kind of caching. We're going to assume LRU caching, because that's what everyone else seems to assume, and, and pretty much what I believe the base operating system does. We want to be able to actually measure what happens when we change the cache size, so we're going to explicitly model the cache as n chunk container slots. Um, less obviously, maybe, that this algorithm reads entire containers. We don't just read a little chunk out of the disk. There are two reasons for this. One is with modern I.O. systems, read speed is so much larger than seek time that reading the extra data is essentially free. The other is that many of these systems, recipes don't actually give container offsets. So there, you can't just say from the recipe, oh, I want to go to byte offset 2,000 in the file and read the next 1,000 bytes. What you actually get is, oh, okay, I need to go over to this container and then consult a little index in the beginning of the container or some similar possibility. Now, you may have noticed that I've been talking about cache size here. And you may think that's just a property of the way I'm measuring things, and it's not actually important. But it turns out cache size is actually fundamental. This is because larger caches smooth out small scale, yes, smooth out small scale fragmentation. So it's you know asking how fragmented is the backup is kind of like asking how smooth is the coastline. There isn't really a single useful answer. There, you can only give an answer given a scale. And for fragmentation, cache size is what sets the scale. Okay, so now I'm going to show you some results about how fragmentation varies over time if you don't do anything about it. Of course, to do that, I need data sets. So if I have, we have two data sets in the paper. I only have time to talk about one of them in this talk, so I'll be presenting results from the first one of these called the two years. This is synthetic data that is a fragmentation stress test that was given to us by HP Storage. They created it based on their customer data. Roughly speaking, it's generated as follows. You start with a 10 gigabyte file system snapshot, and then for each simulated day, you choose 2% of the files at random and modify a random 10% of their bytes by overwriting. 200 megabytes of original data are also added each simulated day. Each simulated week, we take one full, then four incrementals, and we do this for two simulated years, leading to 480 backups. This data set is chunked with variable size chunks with a mean size of four kilobytes. The data set in the paper on um, work group is real data, but we only have 91 days of that data. A few other extra experimental de details for all the results in this talk. All results are simulated. We do perfect deduplication except for the last approach capping I'll tell you in a bit. And the default chunk container size, as I said, is four megabytes. Perhaps um, less obviously, we delete backups after 30 days. This is because it's simply unrealistic to just keep backups forever. No one can really afford to keep 480 backups. This is cheap, but it's not that cheap. We have, however, have tried other different deletion schedules, like some people when they're dealing with tapes, instead of you know, keeping 30 days and then throwing away the tape while well, reusing the tape, they'll do things like f grandfather, father, son, where some tapes, like the first of the month, might get kept for a year, then the ones that the first of the week might otherwise get kept for a month, and the, the other days just get kept a week. And these don't appear to affect our results very much, other than the overall deduplication factor of the store does change. We are also not simulating any housekeeping to merge containers. If we were to merge um, small containers after deletion, it might somewhat improve the fragmentation results, but that does involve moving chunks. Okay, some graphs. Um, so the bottom here is time, basically, backup number. And on the left axis is our fragmentation metric. Higher is worse, as you would expect. I'm also showing four different cache size values. The top one is the sm smallest at 128 megabytes, and the bottom the green one is the biggest with 100, sorry, one gigabyte. As you can see, pretty much your eye is not deceiving you. 
the fragmentation is pretty much linearly increasing over time, um, and the higher cache size does somewhat reduce fragmentation, but it does not, at least with this data set, seem to appreciably change the slope. Um, as I said, speed factor, our restore um, proxy, is the reciprocal of this, which looks like this, which is to say, over time, your restore gets slower and slower and slower, and I am, in fact, clipping a little bit the thing on the top left. It actually starts somewhere around 3x, I believe, although that falls off very quickly. Um, because this is a reciprocal of a linearly growing curve, you can roughly think of this as after some initial constants have been overcome. As you double the number of backups, you have the restore speed. Needless to say, this is not good. To give you some idea of perspective of how this might work in a real system, we consider a system that has a shelf of disks. It has 10 data drives that are being grouped into one RAID 6 group. We estimate with some generous assumptions that the 0.2 a speed factor, as is shown on the lower right, corresponds to eight megabytes a second. Now you can obviously add more shelves of disks and if you have good parallelism, you can get somewhat better speed. But I assure you, numbers like this do not make marketing people happy. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you about two approaches to improving restore speed today. These are independent approaches that could be used separately or combined. The first one I'm gonna tell you about is designed to reduce seeks through better caching. In particular, we have a new caching method we call the forward assembly area method. It exploits the perfect knowledge of future accesses that are available to us courtesy of the recipe. Now remember, we have this recipe that lists all the chunks in order and where they're, they're located. So we can sort of peek ahead and look at the recipe and figure out which chunks we're gonna actually use in the future. And then we, that way we don't have to keep around in our cache chunks that are never gonna be used. This method is also designed to minimize me o memory overhead. Now remember, we're dealing with a lot of variable size small objects, our chunks, which have average size four kilobytes. So if we have too much overhead per object, this is gonna kill us. It's also designed to reduce memory copies. This method is best explained by example. Okay, so here I've split my screen into two halves. The top here is a representation of our store. The orange blob, rectangle, whatever, is our recipe, and the other three colored things are chunk containers. Now I told you this wasn't gonna be realistic. Here are the chunk containers each contain three chunks. Realistically, chunk containers have hundreds to thousands of chunks. The bottom of the screen is RAM, where we have three buffers. The largest of these buffers that takes up the majority of the space is the forward assembly area. Here I'm showing it as taking 100 megabytes. This is the area we're gonna to use to assemble the backup, one slice at a time. So the idea is that we're gonna start with 100 megabytes, the first section, we're gonna assemble it in memory and then send it out. Then we're gonna assemble the next 100 megabytes and send it out, and then the next 100 megabytes and send it out. To do this, we make use of two additional buffers. There's a fixed size container buffer that's just big enough to hold one of our chunk containers, that is to say four megabytes, and we have a small recipe buffer that's about 2% of the size of the forward assembly area. This is gonna hold just enough of the recipe to describe the part we're currently assembling. So let's start. First we load in the uh, part of the recipe that describes our forward assembly area as I described. We're gonna now use this information to assign where, sorry, to calculate where chunks, are, which chunks are going to be needed and where they're gonna to need to be put in the chunk, sorry, in the forward assembly area as I've shown with the arrows. So for example, on the far left you see we're gonna need a, a chunk from the blue container, then we're gonna need two chunks from the purple container, and then a chunk from the yellow container, and so on. Our algorithm works as follows. We're gonna find the leftmost unfilled chunk spot. In this case, it's that leftmost blue one. And we're gonna load the chunk container that, course, that has that chunk into our buffer, like so. Now we're gonna copy all the blue chunk spots that we need in the forward assembly area, whose data we now have in RAM, into place. This, of course, is the, is the one on the left that we, need, we loaded the container for, but we're also gonna get all the other chunk spots in our forward assembly area that come from that same container. At this point, we've finished using the blue container and we can move on. Next spot that is not filled is purple. So we load in purple, copy it into place, and now we're done with purple. Lastly, we load yellow, copy into place, and now we have assembled the entire slice and we're ready to send it out to the client and then start over again. To recap, the forward assembly area method caches only needed chunks, so it uses memory more efficiently than LRU. It moves chunks directly into position, so there's no intermediate storage or extra copies involved. We actually have two variants of this method. The one I've just showed you is called fixed, and it does one slice at a time. It's simpler and easier to understand, but a little less efficient. It basically has a nice property that loads each container only once per slice. So you notice it didn't matter how many spots were blue that I needed to fill in for my blue container, I still loaded it once per slice. Remember, the forward assembly area can be much bigger than the size of a chunk container. This gets, allows us to get considerable reuse. We have an alternative variant we call rolling that overcome, well, sorry, 
there's a, what drawback of fixed is that there are extra reloads around slice boundaries because, like I said, we load it once per slice, but if you use it at the end of the slice and then you use it at the beginning of the next slice, you'll have to load it twice. Rolling improves upon this by basically advancing the assembly area and outputting data incrementally. This allows it to load each container at most once each slice, byte, that slice size bytes, which in this case is 100 megabytes. Let's see how this works. So as before, we basically, I'm showing you after we finish loading in the blue container and copying into place. In the fixed case, we would just go on to the purple container. But in the rolling variant, we observe that the first piece of data, we have some continuous data that's already ready, which is this blue block on the left. We can write that out to the client, which frees us some buffer space. Now, we really want this buffer space on the other end in order to continue restoring more of the backup. So let's move it there by shifting the buffer. Now, you might think, wait a minute, did he just tell us to move 100 megabytes? No, 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 that, that would be too slow. What we actually do is we use a ring buffer for the Ford assembly area, so we can do this rotation in O1 time. Now that we have this extra buffer space at the end, we can use it to allocate more of the backup and proceed. Now we can you know, load in the purple container, put it into place. We have some more data we can write out. We can slide. We can do some more allocation. We can load in the yellow container. And again, we have some more data. Notice that it's not just the yellow data that we're ready to send out, and we can send it out. Now, I remember I was saying about slice boundaries, that little black arrow, which you may have been watching slide all across, is where the original 100 megabyte slice ended. In this case, we're able to, in a single load of the yellow container, get both of those yellow chunks. If we'd been used rolling, we would have to have reloaded the yellow container after we started the new slice. So does this work and how well? So here's a chart, chart comparing the new assembly method to LRU. On the bottom here, we have the cache size per stream being used to restore data. and the left side, we have the speed factor. Higher is better, of course. You can see a number of things from this chart. First is that rolling is somewhat better than fixed. This is because, again, we do not reload containers when we cross slice boundaries. You can also see that assembly, either variant, substantially outperforms LRU for, for practical cache sizes. Keep in mind these systems often work on hundreds of streams at a time. So a number like 124 megabytes or a gigabyte means 100 gigabytes of RAM just for the, re the restore buffers. You can also see that as you increase the cache size, you improve um, restore speed in a noticeable fashion, up to quite large cache sizes. One other interesting difference between assembly and LRU comes when we vary the cache size. Here I'm showing for one particular system how container size on the, the x-axis changes restore speed on the y-axis. Now in this case, I'm not showing the speed factor because our speed factor did not actually capture the changes in container size. So for this one particular comparison, I need to actually use actual IO characteristics of a system. The exact details shouldn't really matter here. What you should draw from this chart is that basically there's a sweet spot. Basically, when you use larger chunk containers, you can load data more efficiently, but the containers are less useful because fewer of their chunks actually are relevant to the current backup being restored. So depending on the system IO characteristics and your cache size, there's a sweet spot. Not too unsurprising. However, when I show you LRU, you may be a bit more surprised. LRU is the lines at the bottom here. Basically, I characterize this as the LRU performance collapses as you increase container size. And the reason is that LRU, remember, can't tell a useful chunk from a non-useful chunk. And so the fact that the containers are getting bigger and having fewer and fewer useful chunks means that LRU is spending more and more of its precious cache space on useless chunks. And as a consequence, its performance declines. All right, now I'm going to tell you about capping, our other approach for reducing, sorry, improving restore speed. Um, as again, these approaches are orthogonal and you could use either or both. So this approach is designed to, at ingest time to limit fragmentation by reducing deduplication and thus restore time will be faster because fragmentation is, is less. The basic idea is pretty simple. We're going to try and bound our fragmentation measure, that is to say, containers read per megabyte ingested. Now remember, our speed factor is the reciprocal of our fragmentation measure. So if I put an upper bound on my fragmentation, that means a lower bound on my restore speed, aka minimum restore speed. So how can we, are we going to do this? So basically, this is ingest time, remember. We're going to take our input back up, divide it up into 20 megabyte segments, and deduplicate each segment against at most T existing containers. This is going to limit our fragmentation to T plus 5 or 20 megabytes. There's T old containers plus possibly five new containers. That, for those of you slow in the arithmetic, 20 megabytes divided by four megabyte container size equals five. Um, this is, of course, not free, unlike the um, assembly method. We do actually have, we are actually going to end up duplicating some chunks because um, 
We're only deduplicating against some places and not everywhere. However, we can minimize this loss by using the best T containers, that is to say, the ones that have the most chunks we're looking for. This can be illustrated fairly simply. Here I'm showing you the 20 megabyte segment, which I'm actually showing as having, um, I think it's 16 chunks, because I only got so much screen space. And I have the store at the bottom divided up into my chunk containers. And this is the second day of second backup, so we're in the middle of, of there, and so you can see where the append point in the store is. So to do capping, what we're first going to do is whatever the underlying system deduplication method is. In our case, it's perfect deduplication. So this is the assignment of chunks we would get if we did perfect deduplication. You'll notice that some chunk containers have a lot of references and some have very few, and there are a couple of chunks on the end, the dashed lines, that are new data that are going to have to be appended to the end of the store. Now, in capping, our goal is to reduce the number of containers used. At the moment, we're using six containers. So what we're going to do first is we're going to make an inventory of the containers being used, and we're going to sort them by how many chunks are being used. So in this case, for example, container 5 has got the most chunks in it. Seven has, container 7 has 3, container 12 has 3, and so on, going down the line. Then what we're going to do is we're going to have some capping level that we're, is our target. I'm just going to pick t equals 3 for this example. So we're going to allow th up to three old containers. And so we're going to do the obvious thing. We're going to take the top three in our list. So that means the two arrows shown in red, we're not going to accept those deduplications. And we're going to, instead of using references, we're going to copy those to the end of the store and basically treat them as if they were new chunks. Now what this is doing is we started with six containers being used to restore this segment, and now we only need four containers. But like I say, there's a cost. We've had to make two extra chunk copies. Now how good this is, of course, depends on what the trade-off in practice is. If it was the case that I had to give up a huge amount of deduplication to get a little bit of restore speed, this wouldn't be very interesting. But it turns out you can actually get pretty good trade-off. Here I am showing relative speed gain, which is to say how much the restore is speeding up on the x-axis. The y-axis sadly shows it's gain, but it's not the good kind of gain. It's how much more storage space I need. So to put this a little more, oh, and the colors are the various sets of cache sizes. So to put this you know, a little more perspective, suppose we were willing to use 10% more extra space in our system. Then depending on the cache size, that means we can rest increase our restore speed from two to nearly four times by using capping. Oh, the other part I should indicate is that capping starts at no capping at the lower left corner, and as the dots head away from that, it's increasing levels of capping. That is to say, I'm reducing t according to the schedule on the right side. So the first dot is t equals infinity, which is no capping. Then you have 250 containers per 20 megabyte segment, then 200, then 150, and so on. By the time you get down to the end, it's pretty severe. Or, for example, we could say, what if you, we let you have 20% extra storage space? Then, again, depending on cache size, you could get from, f from four to, to about six and a half or so times faster restore performance. All right, I need to wrap up. So obviously, there's only so much I can tell you in a 25-minute talk, but there are more results in the paper, including the other wor work, um, sorry, the other data set, experiments where we vary the segment size for capping, experiments where we show you what happens if you use both assembly area and capping at the same time. We also have a discussion of ingest performance for capping and why we don't think it really slows down very much. And in fact, we have a scheme that can be used to guarantee minimum ingest speed and, of course, related work. So I'll leave you with the summary slide, and thank you, and I'll take questions. Cesare Dubnitsky, Nanas Data. I have a question about uh, capping and uh, backup speed. What is the impact of capping on, on, the, on the writing? So basically, capping is increasing your sp restore speed. That's mm -hmm. the x-axis. Right. So if I start with no capping. Um, right, but, but I'm as asking about backup, right? When you write backup, what is the impact on, on, on speed of backup? Of oh, writing? sorry, sorry, ingest speed. Yes. Basically, it, it depends which scheme you use, but pretty much not much at all. OK. So, in so fact, it might, depending on what scheme you use, be faster. So in your system, if you write fresh data and completely deduplicated data, the, the speed is more or less the same, or there is a difference? So in just time, if you basically just do perfect deduplication, you essentially have performance proportional to how fragmented the backup is before you do capping. However, the previous, sorry, the, the fragmentation of the current backup it depends on the fragmentation of the previous backups, which we have made better due to the capping. Mm -hmm. So it may, in fact, actually be faster. Okay. <laughs>
Let's talk offline. Yeah, so. ask me at the poster session. Okay. I can go into more detail. Uh, Jeff Cannon, Harvard, my college. Um, when you're doing this forward assembly area, I noticed like if you have um, containers A, B, and C, it, the way you described it, um, you, you fill up container A, which is great, and then you uh, go to container B and pick stuff out of that. But I'm wondering if on the, on, on the storage, if container C is actually closer to your current position, wouldn't it make sense to sort things so that you access the containers in a more optimized fashion? If you're doing the fixed variant, I believe some variant of the elevator, uh, elevator algorithm would, in fact, improve speed. You notice that we basically ignored the variances in seek time because there's only so much you can do in one paper. In the rolling case, you have a conflict because, yeah, it might be faster to fill some data in later, but I'm not ready to ship that data out yet. So maybe, maybe I prefer to get the data that I can send out and shift my buffer. I, I, you'd have to do the ex empirical experiments to see. Hi, uh, this is Amrinder Singh Randhawa from EMC BRS. Uh, so you mentioned that you keep ref counts in the capping scheme uh, for the um, containers. I did? No, I didn't. Uh, means you, you remember like uh, how, um, uh, which ones are mapping to which containers and how you build that stuff. Oh, sorry. Map, right? So, so the this, this system, the HP uses actually the recipes directly contain the pointer IDs. I believe if you were to use a more EMC-like solution, you would have to do um, lookups in the chunk thing. I believe once per container. Uh, so, uh, so you are saying that how do you measure the count? Like, how do you know how many recipes, like how many um, uh, recipes are pointing to this container, and if that information is not within the container? So that's outside the scope of this talk. Okay. That'd be like garbage collection. You, you can ask me the poster session, but it's not relevant to this talk. Okay, sure. We'll see. Thank you. Oh, we got another question. Oh, wait. Ah, we, we have three track. minutes left. I can ask, I can take the suggestion prerogative and ask a question. So if you were really trying to focus on read performance and you weren't competing for memory with ingest at the same time and everything and you could vote really large buffers for cash. Everything you got. Would you, everything you got. Would you have a really, really large look ahead buffer in which you'd have to sort of keep scanning your recipe or would, there, would you have to, would the performance of actually bringing in a container and figure out what to do with this data be problematic if your recipe buffer gets particularly large? We don't go into it in a paper, but there are various data structures you can use to basically, um, I see what the better scheme is. You walk the recipe in linear time and you can basically create the back pointers so then when you're going on the forward scan, you don't have to do any additional work. OK. Thanks. So if there are no more questions, uh, let's thank the speaker, but I do have an announcement. Uh, the uh, WIPS uh, participants should please return at 1.45 and meet with the session chair, Joe Tusek, up front. And also a reminder that lunch is on your own today. So now let's thank the speaker. Thank you.